Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. And, uh, well, in today's episode, we're going to hear from Danielle Smith, um, the Premier of Alberta, as she's talking about Alberta health care and what it actually means to Albertans. Um, then we will also be hearing from the uh, Minister of Climate Change, the Federal Minister of Climate Change, as he is talking about the federal climate programs and how working with Germany is, has been a great success and how they actually met a lot of their goals and coming from uh, probably 2022 to current date. Um, We will also hear from a um, an infrastructure project. Uh, it's a, a federally, kind of a federally funded infrastructure project um, in Toronto that is revitalizing some of the town's natural habitats, and it is supposed to be helping the um, Toronto um, with the area that they called the ravines and it means um, natural trails wildlife all those sorts of things that um, a lot of development is actually destroying these days so why don't we start off with um, the, what is going on in Alberta with uh, health care and a lot of things that Danielle Smith is saying that it isn't, it is, they're revamping the system so that it helps protect the health of Albertans. That it isn't just going to simply switch off the social um, health care system and replace it with privatization. That it is going to enhance the social system so that more workers can be uh, put into the system so that patient care and health is more attainable and foreseeable that it will protect it makes ensure that Alberta's uh, the residents of Alberta actually find some of the some of the more innovative ways of treating disease and receiving treatments that heal the body faster. So there's been a lot of lot of criticism towards Danielle Smith with some of the things that she has been trying to do for Alberta, and maybe we should be a little less critical and listen a little harder to what the actual goals are, because they could be helpful. To the rest of Canada. So we'll start off with that and then we'll lead into hey, let's face it, is the federal minister of climate change trying to cover over the fact that he got a bunch of failing grades in one report and push a report out there that hey, I'm the hero, look and see what we have done what our success rate really is because those other guys the other report 
they just didn't know what they were talking about. So, we'll, we'll hear some of that. And then, seriously, a green project in, in a... Canada's biggest urban area that is... And this is probably the way we're going to actually have to push back about. Climate change is by creating spaces that enhance tall trees and curb some of the urban development that actually tears apart habitats for our natural animals and tears apart the natural infrastructures that we need to have in place to prevent things like flooding. Um, they, they're going to actually talk about how the ravines actually carry the water away from the city and puts that same exact water into the, uh, the lake systems that were, were put there by nature. So why don't we start off uh, in Alberta and then move forward from there. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here uh, with Adriana Lagrange, Minister of Health, Dan Williams, Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, Jason Nixon, Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services, Ed Stelmack, Board Chair of Covenant Health, Cody McIntyre, President of Alberta Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association, Elliot Davis, Vice President, Alberta Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association, Sean Turlson, President and CEO of Shepherd's Care Foundation, Dr. Les Scheeler, who is an anesthesiologist, Dr. Susan Prendergast, who is President of the Nurse Practitioner Association of Alberta, Alicia Lob uh, Lobe, the Membership Director of the Alberta Association of Nurses, Kevin Ferguson, Mayor of the Town of Padoka, and Sandy Edmondson, board member of Alberta Health Services. Welcome to a new day for healthcare in Alberta. From the very beginning of our government's mandate, improving healthcare at every level has been the top of our list of priorities. And with delays affecting the whole system, the urgency of the challenge can't be overstated. Wait times for life-saving surgeries, routine care, and mental health treatment are far too long. Alberta's health system isn't working the way it should and the way Albertans deserve. And fixing it is critically important to improving Albertans' quality of life. And improvements must begin with Alberta Health Services, the largest provincially integrated health system in the country. While all Albertans can and should be proud of our frontline professionals, the structure behind them is not setting them up for success. We have seen unacceptable wait times for surgeries and emergency rooms. We've seen constant service disruptions and temporary closures at rural hospitals, EMS code reds and response times not meeting targets. Right now, thousands of Albertans do not have access to a primary care provider, and so many of our seniors are waiting in hospital wards for access to continuing care longer than in any other province. We can point to the ledgers that show our health care spending per person is about the same as the national average and in BC and Ontario, and yet some of our outcomes aren't better and are not improving. For example, Albertans are waiting longer for hip and knee replacements. Only 38% of hip replacements and 27% of knee replacements in our province meet the national wait time benchmarks. And the time Albertans remain in hospital, even after they no longer need hospital care, is four to five days longer than the national average because they lack the supports to return home. The human cost to both patients and their family is immeasurable. I'm not satisfied with the current state of our affairs. And I know Albertans aren't satisfied either. Right after I became Premier, we launched our health care action plan and I directed Dr. John Cowell to make immediate changes to deliver some quick and needed results. We knew that those immediate actions would not fix the entire health care system, but we needed to take steps forward. Thanks to that work, we've seen some improvements, but not enough. I've spoken with Albertans one on one and they've made this report this point to us repeatedly in very personal ways. They've told me about surgeries postponed or cancelled, innovative treatments that are unavailable in our province because of holdups and approvals, and entire days lost to waiting in crowded emergency rooms near a suffering loved one. Some emergency departments have closed their doors because of a lack of staff, which is the exact opposite of why emergency departments exist in the first place. 
Faults in the healthcare system cause needless pain and anxiety at Albertans' most vulnerable times, and they put tremendous strain on the frontline professionals who are working every day to help sick and suffering Albertans. When I spoke with frontline health workers, I began to get a sense of how we could truly make a difference, a long-term lasting difference for Albertans' health care. Without a doubt, we have the best health care workers in the country. They're smart, skilled, endlessly compassionate people who understand their patients and their practice. And yet when they're, they are sidelined when it comes to decision making, even though they understand the problems and see obvious solutions. They try their best, but they end up being stalled and frustrated by a system that lacks focused leadership and governance. The current health system in our province limits government's ability to provide system-wide oversight on behalf of the people of Alberta. It also limits our ability to set priorities and require accountability for meeting them. The current Alberta health care system is one that has forgotten who should be at the center of its existence, patients and the health care experts who look after them. We need to bring Alberta's healthcare system back to its mission of delivering the healthcare Albertans need when and where they need it. We've had recent and extensive consultations with healthcare partners and communities uh, during important projects like modernizing Alberta's primary healthcare system. We've also engaged on areas of emergency medical services, mental health and addiction, continuing care and healthcare system sustainability. Everything we've heard has helped to inform the development of our plan, a plan that I'm pleased to introduce today. This is all about refocusing our healthcare system to prioritize patients and empower healthcare workers. Starting today, we're creating an integrated provincial health care delivery system that concentrates on four priority areas, primary care, acute care, continuing care, and mental health and addiction. We believe that by creating specialized organizations within one provincial system, we will enable each organization to look after one area of health care only and avoid the scattered and uncoordinated approach of the more rigid centralized structure that exists now. These changes will apply province-wide to avoid the regional fragmentation that existed prior to the current system. This focus will help the new organizations better manage performance and promote expertise in areas be faster and more responsive to issues, recognize innovative solutions, and make space for local decision making and advice. The newly refocused system will be more accountable, ensuring consistent quality care across the province. Patient outcomes will be better monitored as a result. And all of this will result in a better system, not only for patients, but also for healthcare workers. Frontline healthcare workers will be a large part of organizations that are dedicated to their area of practice, providing undivided attention to issues and giving workers room to innovate and apply solutions with fewer delays due to bureaucracy. Through this process, though this process begins today, we understand that restructuring takes time and dedicated effort. This is why we have named a transition team to guide the process of forming these organizations and Minister Adriana Lagrange will have details on these changes and the team that will oversee the transition of AHS. But I want to be clear about this plan, about what it is and what it is not. I made a public health care guarantee to Albertans. That means no one will ever pay out of pocket for a, a visit to a doctor or for hospital services. And that is not changing. These reforms have nothing to do with privatization. They are also not about cuts. Alberta's government will continue to grow the health care workforce and we anticipate that there will be no job losses to HS staff working in frontline positions who are de directly delivering patient care. In fact, our government knows that Alberta needs more health care workers and so will continue to recruit and train more of them. This isn't change for the sake of change. This is a matter of redirecting Alberta's health care system, making it patient-centered, seamless and effective. It's about giving healthcare workers a structure that supports their success and the opportunity to use solutions they know will work as quickly and effectively as possible. This is change that will mean the right forms of care are available for Albertans when and where they need them now and for generations to come. Our plan won't lead to change overnight, but it will lead to swift and effective reforms that will make life better for everyone from patients to doctors to nurses and other healthcare professionals. I want to invite Minister LaGrange to share more details on our path and how we'll deliver the kind of results that Albertans are looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Premier, and good morning to everyone. We are at a critical juncture when it comes to healthcare in Alberta. 
As Premier said, we are refocusing Alberta Health Services so that we can provide a high-functioning health care system that prioritizes patient care and empowers our health care workers. We are beginning this change by listening to health care, to the health care workforce, and to Albertans. Throughout this process, we will rely on the expertise of health care workers and will work with them to make changes for the better. We will also listen to Albertans who use the system every day to ensure their experiences and ideas are part of these changes. During this transition, we will work to minimize disruption to the daily work of healthcare staff and our prior priority will always be, and I want to repeat that, always be to protect frontline jobs. I would like to thank Dr. John Cowell for stepping up to serve as the official administrator of Alberta Health Services since last October. Today I am announcing a new AHS board which is made up of seven members and I'm pleased to announce that Dr. Lyle Oberg will be the chair. Dr. Oberg has years of extensive experience as a physician, rural practitioner, and multifaceted leader. Under Dr. Oberg's leadership, this board will guide the changes that will gradually unfold over the next 18 months. It is crucial we take the time to get this work right which is why it will roll out in stages over the coming months and years. In addition to the new AHS board, transitional boards for the organizations will be named over the coming weeks. The first organization to be formed will be the new continuing care organization, which we expect will be ready to go this coming spring. The new continuing care organization will seamlessly continue the work of transforming the area of continuing care, which is already well underway. So this work, uh, so this includes work to streamline Alberta's continuing care legislation, developing services and supports for home and community care, improving existing continuing care facilities, and exploring better options to empower Albertans to live where and how they want to. The Continuing Care Organization will be responsible for oversight and coordina coordination services and supports, and all operators, including the refocused Alberta Health Services as well as Covenant Health. All of these operators will continue to deliver services under contract with the new Continuing Care Organization. Incidentally, this solves a long-standing issue where AHS both procures and provides services in continuing care. The establishment of the new continuing care organization will be quickly followed by the launch of the new mental health and addictions organization. And you will get more details from Minister Williams on this organization in just a few moments. In the fall of 2024, we expect to unveil the final two organizations, primary care and acute care. The new primary care organization will be dedicated to the delivery of primary health care, that is, ensuring that every Albertan has access to a doctor, nurse practitioner, pharmacist, and any other primary health care provider that is necessary. I know how distressing it can be when you don't have a health care professional to turn to, whether it's for immediate advice or a regular checkup. Primary care providers should be the first stop when health issues arise. But for the many Albertans who do not have one, it means their health will go unchecked, which could result in some very serious health implications later on. The core mandate of the new primary care organization will be to ensure every Albertan is connected to a regular family doctor, nurse practitioner, or primary care facility, regardless of where they live in the province. As I announced a few weeks ago, we have already begun these efforts to stabilize and improve access to primary care in all areas of the province. The recommendations in the Modernizing Primary Care Systems reports made by the expert panels will inform the direction of the new primary care organization and its work will go on to strengthen Alberta's primary health care system. Finally, 
the new acute care organization will oversee delivery of services in areas including hospitals, urgent care centers, cancer care, clinical operations, surgeries, and emergency medical services. AHS will become a service provider much like Covenant Health. Both, along with other contracted emergency service providers, will work with the new acute care organization to continue to improve wait times for emergency care, whether it be in, on an ambulance call or an emergency room wait. All four of the new healthcare organizations will also be focused on empowering appropriate decision making at a local level so we are more responsive to the needs of Albertans on the ground. They will be aided in this by 12 new advisory councils, which are replacing the existing 12 AHS advisory councils, as well as a new Indigenous advisory council. These local advisory councils will represent and advocate for regional perspectives, bring forward local priorities, and give input on how to continually improve the system. Overall, alignment between the four new health organizations will be overseen by an integration council that will also track efficiencies, remove barriers, and improve outcomes. This is how four new organizations will continue to operate seamlessly within a single provincial health system. There will be rigor to this process ensuring that patients and the workforce are at the forefront of every decision. The Ministry of Health will also change its structure to better align with the new organizations, including creating a procurement and system optimization secretariat and expanding the role of the Health Quality Council of Alberta. As I said earlier, all along this process, we will be consulting with the healthcare workers who are crucial to the system's success. This is a huge undertaking, but a necessary one. There are many facets to this work, but all of it will follow seven non-negotiable guiding principles. And they are, one, a single functioning healthcare system with specialized areas that focus on delivering the best care that is important to a high functioning system. Two, Improving patient outcomes by ensuring Albertans get the best care when and where they need it. Three, creating seamless integration and collaboration between all of the new organizations so patients will experience a smooth health care journey with appropriate transitions in care where needed. Four, supporting a workforce whose own well-being is prioritized, whose expertise is leveraged, and whose decision-making is empowered. Five, promoting local decision-making by incorporating regional advice. Six, keeping communication transparent and making frequent efforts to stay in touch with frontline workers and patients alike. And seven, fully committing to our plans, but also remaining flexible to support the ideas and perspectives from our frontline workers and from Albertans. I want to emphasize this important piece. Throughout this process, you will continue to access health care how and where you normally would. For a health emergency, you will still call an ambulance or go to the hospital. Surgeries will still happen the same way as they are, they are right now. You will still visit your family doctor, primary care clinic, walk-in clinic, lab, pharmacist, and so on for day-to-day -day healthcare needs and advice. If you or a loved one need assisted living, you will still access continuing care sites or home care. We are committed to this plan because we are committed to Albertans, and they deserve the very best healthcare system possible. This is exciting. This is an opportunity to take care of the system and the people that keeps all of us healthy. And refocus, refocusing is so that we can work not only, the refocus is so that it will work not only for us, but for all Albertans long into the future. This is so critically important. We have to provide for now, but we also have to provide for the next generations. So thank you, and I will now invite Minister Williams to the podium.
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Minister LaGrange. Uh, as you just heard, the refocusing of Alberta's provincial health system will include a renewed focus on mental health and addiction. Today's announcement expands on the work we have been engaged in over the last four years to build out the Alberta recovery model. We have already taken significant steps in increased access and treatment and recovery sports, supports by one, adding more than 10,240 addiction treatment spaces throughout our province, two, removing the $1,240 a month user fee to get access to life-saving treatment for those in the deadly disease of addiction, three, by building 11 long-term recovery communities through the province, two of which, pardon me, two of which are already open and operating. The opening of these facilities will increase the addiction treatment capacity in Alberta by more than 50%. We're, we're providing same-day, no-fee, no-wait-list immediate access to evidence-based treatment through the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program. And we're expanding options for counseling and mental health supports throughout the province. These are just a few of the steps that were already taken to build out the Alberta Recovery Model, which is receiving international acclaim but more work is to be done. The creation of this model was made possible because of the creation of my ministry, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction. As part of the provincial refocusing, my ministry will take on a new role by overseeing the funding and service delivery of all mental health and addiction services currently overseen by the Ministry of Health. The ministry will, my ministry will work closely to oversee the new provincial mental health and addiction organization being created. This new organization will be responsible for the delivery of mental health and addiction services currently delivered by AHS. This includes the delivery of a comprehensive continuum of care that includes prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery supports. We will also be working closely with the nonprofits and charitable organizations who provide many mental health and addiction services across our province. Lastly, my ministry will work closely to take on a greater role to provide system oversight including service planning and capital planning for mental health and addiction services in Alberta. These changes will allow us to deliver mental health and addiction services and care more effectively for Albertans. We are committed to supporting every Albertan struggling with their mental health or suffering from the deadly disease of addiction in the pursuit of recovery. This will be done by supporting this full continuum of supports that are focused on recovery and by removing barriers and expanding services that will support across the province for all Albertans. The current AHS Senior Program Officer for Mental Health and Addiction, Carrie Bales, will lead the transition toward the new Mental Health and Addiction Organization. Dr. Nick Mitchell, the Provincial Medical Director of Addiction and Mental Health at AHS, and Dr. Nathaniel Day, the Medical Director of Addiction and Mental Health and Correlational Health Services at AHS, will also be important members of this transitional team. Their extensive knowledge and experience will be instrumental in guiding the work underway to establish the new Provincial Mental Health and Addiction Organization by mid-2024, as we heard from Minister LaGrange. While ensuring stability and continuity of mental health and addiction care will be a priority. As you move forward, our vision remains the same. Anyone suffering from the deadly disease of addiction or who has mental health challenges deserves an opportunity to pursue recovery and live a full life in our society. As Minister LaGrange mentioned, we want to hear directly from frontline workers to ensure that their voice helps guide us in this government's efforts to refocus Alberta's health care system on Alberta and on Albertans. Together, we know that we can provide better care for Albertans. Thank you for your time. Good morning. I'd like to express my gratitude to the government of Alberta for listening to the voices of frontline workers. Although there was a slight delay, we are pleased to see that the APEC report recommendations are being implemented by Minister LaGrange and Premier Smith. We, the Alberta Professional Firefighters and Paramedic Association, are hopeful that these changes will bring about much needed improvements in the working conditions and the overall health and well-being of all pre-hospital care practitioners. We look forward to working closely with our government 
in enhancing the lives of all Albertans. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Turlson. I'm president and CEO of the Shepherd's Care Foundation, a registered charity that's faith-based. I'm here today representing the Alberta Continuing Care Association as past chair. The Alberta Continuing Care Association applauds the recent health care reforms by the Alberta government and in its commitment to advancing health care services for our beloved seniors. These reforms align with our mission of creating a sustainable and innovative continuing care sector. We're eager to work in collaboration with Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health, in providing our expertise, advocating for best practices, and fostering innovation of our beloved seniors' well-being. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we move on to um, to what uh, the Federal Minister of Climate Change has to say about activities that they and, and projects that they have done with uh, Germany then and what successes have actually come from it. Merci, thank you, Samantha. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good day, good uh, good afternoon, good evening, perhaps. Um, uh, very happy to, to have this opportunity to provide an update on the $100 billion dollar a goal that um, Jennifer and I, as well as Canada and Germany, have been working on for uh, working hard on for the last three years. Uh, pour le Canada et l'Allemagne, faire progresser le financement contre la lutte au changement climatique est essentiel uh, pour faire face à la crise climatique. Uh, au cours des dernières années, particulièrement au cours des derniers mois, uh, j'ai pu écouter des dizaines de représentants de pays du Sud. Euh, et nous parler des, des besoins qui augmentent euh, de façon euh, constante en matière d'impact des changements climatiques, d'adaptation aux changements climatiques. Um, uh, over the last many years, and, and, and more so over the last few, few months, as co-facilitators uh, to support the COP28 president, I've, I've been uh, listening and hearing uh, from, from dozens and dozens of uh, countries in the global south how uh, the, the needs to, to face the impacts of climate change are, are ever growing. Garder l'objectif d'1.5 degré à portée de main requiert une mobilisation uh, accrue uh, de toutes les sources de financement, nationales, internationales, publiques et privées. Uh, nous devons travailler ensemble pour financer les, les centaines de milliards nécessaires à la transition vers un monde carboneutre et respectueux de la nature. With, with this update, we continue to show our commitment towards meeting the $100 billion goal urgently and towards improving the quality and effectiveness of, of climate finance. We are today publishing a joint letter that takes talks of progress on, on this goal. We're including a, a spotlight on four action areas that were identified last year in the Climate Finance Delivery Plan Progress Report, which are adaptation finance, private finance mobilized, access, and finance from, from NDBs. We hope this will provide a clear picture of where we stand on the goal, but also what remains to be done. I will now turn over the floor to my friend and colleague, Jennifer Morgan. Thank you so much. Um, Stephen Gobo, Minister Gobo, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, for Germany as well, um, obviously we know the importance uh, over the years of climate finance and therefore with Canada have been uh, working to coordinate the contributor um, countries around this important goal of the 100 billion. And earlier today, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, the OECD, published a report showing that in 2021, climate finance contri contributors collectively provided and mobilized 89.6 US, uh, a billion US dollars in climate finance. And this is an important increase uh, from 2020 when we delivered um, $83.3 billion in climate finance and it exceeds the projections uh, made by the OECD before COP26 in the context of the climate finance delivery plan led by Canada and Germany. 
We were also pleased to see the OECD Secretary General indicating that based on preliminary data for 2022, there is a likelihood that the goal was already met in 2022 and certainly was met in 2023. And this is further underpinned by the good increase of the reported climate finance by MDBs in 2022. We recognize that releasing uh, concrete fi uh, figures for 22 and 23 must happen as soon as possible. Um, and generating robust data, though, we know that takes time and it's very important from a transparency and an accountability uh, perspective. And so along with all other contributors, we're committed to working with the OECD to enable the release of climate finance data in due course. This progress has been uh, possible thanks to the concerted efforts by all climate finance contri contributors to uh, raise ambition. And meeting the 100 billion uh, goal was an important step forward, but as uh, Stephen Gilbo said, it's clear that we cannot stop here. Uh, further scaling up and improving climate finance will require coordinated efforts by a whole range of actors. Uh, handing it back over to Minister Google. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this is not just about the quantum of dollars spent. Uh, earlier today, the OECD published two other reports on adaptation finance and private finance mobilized. The reports take stock of current challenges uh, and provide recommendations to overcome these challenges. We will continue to assess and work to implement these recommendations, uh, recognizing significant effort will be required for meaningful progress. So on adaptation, the OECD report, along with the UNEP's adaptation gap report, show we need to continue increasing our focus on adaptation finance. I am committed to continue to work with everyone so we collectively double our adaptation finance by 2025 in line with the Glasgow Climate Pact. We confirmed with contributors that all countries remain on track to meet their individual adaptation targets and commitments. Contributors are collectively prioritizing uh, adaptation and climate finance programming. They're also continuing in particular to seek innovative ways to, to increase support for the most vulnerable. We expect a long-term trend of increasing adaptation finance to continue. Sur la question du financement privé, l'OCDE souligne également que nous devons faire preuve, nous devons faire plus pour mobiliser le, le financement privé, ce qui sera, je, je, je l'espère, et sur quoi portera une partie des, des, des conversations à la COP28 à Dubaï. Nous devons trouver de quelle façon nous pouvons augmenter les montants de capitaux privés mobilisés par le financement public dans le cadre de la lutte au changement climatique, tout en réduisant le coût en capital pour les pays en, dé en développement. Nous savons que les besoins augmentent, c'est pourquoi nous devons saisir toutes les occasions de travailler en coopération avec l'ensemble des partenaires pour mobiliser ces ressources. Et nous poursuivrons le travail en ce sens, notamment en cherchant des possibilités de partenariats innovants. Je me suis engagé à faire progresser le financement privé car il permettra de puiser dans les ressources cruciales qui nous permettront d'apporter le soutien nécessaire à la réalisation des objectifs de l'accord de Paris. Jennifer, back over to you. Thanks, Stephen. I mean, uh, in addition to um, the action on adaptation and private finance, that was the two issues. The two others um, were the following on access, which was uh, incredibly important. And we heard a lot uh, from um, developing countries on the importance of that. And I'm just back from the Pacific Island Forum, and I could tell you for SIDS and LDCs, this is actually a, a, a fundamental issue that needs particular attention. And we need to continue to work to break the barriers that prevent those who require support from accessing it. Since we published the progress report last year, various actors across the climate finance landscape have taken steps in the right direction. Progress is visible in improved and streamlined processes to access funding from large funds, such as the Green Climate Fund, where it was a real priority um, for us to uh, have the new strategy, uh, prioritize access, uh, as well as through continued efforts from the task force on access. A, ma a major component of access relates to debt, as many of the most vulnerable recipients grapple with the debt burden challenges. To, and, and to improve on this, we continue to identify ways and possible instruments such as grants and guarantees to not increase the debt burden any further. First, debt for sw climate swaps are being implemented. 
And as we look beyond the 100 billion goal, we will continue engaging with climate finance recipients and the broader contributor community to tackle access challenges, top priority. The second is on finance from MDBs. In addition um, to the steps taken uh, by climate finance contributors, there is significant momentum on climate finance action in the MDB space. In 2022, MDBs surpassed their collective targets to 2025 on climate finance, adaptation finance, and private finance mobilized. And beyond this, the World Bank has recently adopted an updated vision statement, which emphasizes the need for a, quote, livable planet, and outlines steps to increase its lending capacity over the coming decades. So working to leverage these positive dynamics is an opportunity to catalyze substantial resources towards progress on climate. And it is clear that MDBs are prioritizing climate more than ever before. But we will continue advocating for tangible, rapid progress from MDBs on the climate front, including through ongoing reform efforts. Back over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Jennifer. And I, I really want to conclude by, by thanking you and, and the German team uh, who've done some amazing work over the course of the last three years to, to enable us to, 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 to be where we are and really working to mobilize uh, countries, that, that, that contributory countries uh, to, to this effort, talking to, 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 to NDBs uh, and, uh, and other stakeholders. I also want to thank the, the OECD as well for their support uh, to all developed countries. COP28 president asked us to support him in demonstrating progress on the $100 billion earlier this year. So we are encouraged by, by this update. Uh, nous sommes impatients de collaborer avec nos partenaires dans les pays en développement et d'échanger davantage avec eux sur cette mise en situation. Mais bien entendu, il faut continuer à faire du progrès. Ça s'applique uh, tant pour l'objectif du 100 milliards de dollars, mais également pour fournir des clarifications importantes sur l'avenir du financement de la lutte contre les changements climatiques, dont le nouvel objectif chiffré collectif qui sera décidé à la COP29. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, Samantha, back over to you. A green project in Canada's largest urban area. The ravines in Toronto and how it is going to help Toronto grow to be a green city and what effects it has for for Canada as far as climate changes and how we can create and coexist with the wildlife and tall trees. Good morning and thank you for joining us for this announcement from Infrastructure Canada. I'm Helen Burston and I have the privilege of leading Evergreen's Board of Directors as its chair since 2014. On behalf of the board and all of Evergreen, we welcome you here today. And what a gorgeous day we picked too. I want to thank the Deputy Prime Minister and our local member of Parliament, the Honourable Christian Freeland for making this announcement today and choosing Evergreen. And I want to thank Mayor Olivia Chow and our Ward Councillor Diane Sachs for attending as well. We're so pleased to have you all here, wonderful women all. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here to mark this important investment for the people of Toronto. At Evergreen, we believe in the transformative power of public spaces great public spaces that improve people's physical and mental well-being, build social ties and strengthen communities, support resilience, and support biodiversity in our urban habitats. Now more than ever, public spaces are critical to the health and well-being of people and our planet. And by improving those public spaces, we create a better world for generations to come. At least we hope so. So thank you for joining us to celebrate this vital investment. Now, I'd like to uh, welcome Evergreen's Director of Fund Development, Susie Wilcox, who will be our MC this morning. Susie, over to you. Thank you and good morning. Thank you for coming here today on this beautiful 
incredible November morning here at the Brickworks. I feel like this is a sign, and it's a good sign. I'd like to start with the facts about where we stand today. Evergreen is situated on the traditional land and waterways of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit, in addition to other peoples named and unnamed. The Brickworks is governed by Treaty 13 and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe confederacies and allies to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes, like this beautiful Don River Valley that we're in today. Today, Toronto, or Tuckeronto, a Mohawk word meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we seek opportunities to work with them in true partnership. In fact, land acknowledgements are not only about the land and the water, but also about working in better ways with people on the land and treating the creatures that use the land and the water with respect and care. We are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. We are grateful at Evergreen to have the opportunity to work within this territory and the community as a whole. I want to thank Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland Mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow, and Councillor Diane Sachs for joining us today for this announcement. Thank you, Evergreen CEO Jen Angel, for sharing the impact of this announcement on the communities we serve. Thank you, members of the media, for attending and sharing the story broadly. And thank you to the rest of our guests who have joined us. Thank you to Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre for attending. Hello, Andrea. And folks from LGA Architects and Colliers, guests from the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, City of Toronto. Thank you to our board members for coming today, Evergreen staff, visitors and community members who've joined us to celebrate this truly wonderful news about the green and energy efficient future of this community space in that building over there. After remarks conclude, we'll have a media Q&A and then I'd like to welcome speakers together for a photo. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Deputy Prime Minister Freeland to the stage. Okay, well, thank you very, very much um, for that uh, kind introduction to all the work that happens here. Uh, and thank you for all the work you do. Uh, bonjour, je tiens d'abord à reconnaître que nous sommes réunis sur le territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations notamment les Mississaugas du Credit, les Anishinaabeg, les Chippewa, les Haudenosaunee et les Wendat. Je suis très heureuse d'être à Toronto aujourd'hui dans ma circonscription de University Rosedale, au magnifique centre Evergreen Brickworks avec la mairesse Chow, la conseillère Diane Sachs et Jennifer. Um, you know, this really is an event, an announcement, an investment for the whole city of Toronto, for the city we live in and we love. Um, and it's also a great neighborhood event right now. I see lots of my constituents here. And uh, just as I was uh, riding over, I reflected on the fact that this is the second event Diane and I have been at together over the past week and the second event that the mayor and I have been at together over the past week. And, you know, I think one of the things that that shows you is um, how committed we all are to working together for our wonderful city. Um, as the local MP, and as someone who lives just up the hill, I know how important and beloved the Brickworks is for the people of Toronto, for the families of Toronto from the great running trails to the Saturday Farmer's Market, which is where we're standing right now. Um, we can talk about what our favorite foods are afterwards. I'm fond of the bacon sandwich. Um, this is really the best place in our city to enjoy the beauty of Toronto's ravines, something we are so fortunate to have here in our city. It is also the best place to learn about the ravine system. 
There are fantastic programs here at the Brickworks to teach both children and adults about how to practice sustainability and how to keep our ravine system vibrant. All of you are doing such important work here at the Brickworks. Um, as Helen said to us, you know, having vibrant public spaces is such an important part of having a vibrant, healthy community that works and lives as a community. And this is one of the lungs, one of the hearts of our city. Um, your work is so important and our government is here to help you continue doing that important work. So I am truly excited to announce that the federal government is investing $2 million to rehabilitate the Ravine Center. This investment will go towards helping to lower energy consumption and emissions through upgrades that will cut the energy costs of the building in half. And this investment will help create a new indigenous programming space right here at the Brickworks. This space is more than a building. This is important community infrastructure. It is the social infrastructure that helps us not just live, but thrive, and that helps us have a place where we can live together. Um, there was some research that came out this week that I found really sad um, about how lonely um, and isolated we are. And that's something that can happen in a big city and that's something that COVID probably made worse. Having beautiful, attractive, appealing public spaces that take us outside, uh, like the Brickworks, is such an important part of combating that loneliness and of bringing us together. Building more vibrant communities like this one is at the heart of our government's economic plan. And Toronto, our amazing city, is at the heart of our economic plan. That's why our government has and will continue to invest in Toronto, whether it's building more housing, and the mayor and I were at a housing announcement on Tuesday, improving public transit, or investing in essential community spaces like the Brickworks. By helping to make it more sustainable, our government is helping to ensure that the Brickworks can continue its educational work and become an even more treasured gathering space for the people of Toronto for generations to come. En contribuant à la durabilité du centre Brickworks, notre gouvernement veut faire en sorte qu'il poursuive sa mission éducative et qu'il reste un lieu de rassemblement précieux pour les résidents et les résidents de Toronto, et ce, pour les générations à venir. Alors, merci beaucoup, et je vais maintenant céder la parole à Susie. Back to you, Susie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Freeland, and it's great to learn from a pro what to do with the microphone, so thanks. That was a great little hack. I love that. Exactly. I, we can talk about this later. Okay. I know. I appreciate that. that is really amazing. Me and Tom Cruise. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Minister Freeland. I'd now like to welcome uh, Mayor Olivia Chow to speak. Two weekends ago, I was here with thousands of people. You have a special. Uh, Mexican Day of the Dead celebration. And there were children, there were families, and I had one of my staff, it was in between two events, I pulled him here. He's never been to any of the trails. And he was just like, wow, almost in the heart of the city. It's like taking a high-speed train into a place just lifts you up, into nature and it's all free and of course I stop to shop and to eat that's part of the experience after you walk for a while you need to do that and there was an art exhibit going on 
and there was a tree with poetry tied onto a, a, a branch that looks like a tree. And those poor trees are rolled together as a uh, poetry dealing with grief or, and dealing with passing of people. It was so beautiful because I watched people reading it and then curled it back up and putting it back to share to other people. And I watched kids doing it, I watched family doing it. It's really a place where people come together. It is the social capital the, that the minister were talking about, to bring us together so we feel we belong. Belong as a community, belong into a city, but belong not just physically, but spiritually, and also belonging in a way that understand our past and our future, which is where the Ravine Center comes in. As I was explaining to my friend, about the trail. I didn't have a trail map to say you go turn right, you go this way and that way. Now, with a revitalized, retrofitted ravine center, you will have programming from indigenous folks so they can learn about the past and the future and take a step and a real meaningful step towards reconciliation but also able to understand the programming and the trails that is around us, all of it being done with very low carbon footprint, with solar panels, heat pumps, and all of those important elements. And today, I helped raise the Métis flag. It is Louis Riel Day. And knowing that history, understanding the injustice that was in the past, learning about it, and having the Ravine Center featuring that important aspect of indigenous programming is so, so special. So I'm very grateful on behalf of the city of Toronto and the people of Toronto and all the people that use, that come and visit the Evergreen we're very grateful for the federal government and the minister in the provision of the $2 million to make Ravine Center a reality. In future, I'm going to come and skate with my grandkids, the farmer's market, the artisan market, and the shop and the eat, and most important of all, connecting with nature. So, Thank you very much for your generous contribution and Brickworks putting in $900,000 and all of it coming together to make Ravine Center a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Chow, and thank you for coming to our Good Morning Festival. It, a, a, a space for grief, an exhibit that is so touching is still on for a few more days in our city builders gallery in the td future city center for all of you who miss it and it is free so thank you uh, i'd now like to welcome councillor diane Sachs to share a few words hello everybody it's how great to be out uh, speaking with other short women who also biked here. Um, it is so exciting to be back here at my absolute favorite local charity. Uh, you all know, I hope, that nature and the ravines are critical to Toronto. They're a part of what is special about our city. They're part of what makes our city livable. They're part of what ties us to the history of the land here. And 20 odd years ago when I was on the board of Evergreen and we first sat in that building and I will say the heat did not work and we sat around a rickety table with mismatched chairs and we tried to imagine what could happen with this derelict site could we actually make it a beautiful successful place for nature in the city for all the people 
who don't have access to nature. And especially for those, you know, some, some people have cottages, some people get to spend time in nature, lots and lots of people in the city don't. And we've had so many people over the years come here who've never been in the woods before. So here we sat around this rickety table and we tried to imagine, could we pull this off? I mean, we were a little charity and we were talking about spending millions and millions of dollars on all kinds of old buildings with heritage problems and contamination problems and legal problems and some very difficult people at the city, but anyway, that would go. So, but here we are. And that vision has been realized to such an extent all around you and in the thousands of people that are here every weekend and the kids who come to camp and, and all the people who have benefited here over the years. But we, and we've really been successful in making Evergreen at the Brickworks one of the keys, one of the doors to the ravine system of Toronto, to nature in the city, and I will say to bringing private money to support public space. And we know that public space is an absolute key to the quality of life in the city. It's key to our sustainable future, it's key to livable future, it's key to dealing with inequality, it's key to, key to dealing with climate change. And we need so much more, we need so much investment in our ravines and we need to make more space in the public sphere for indigenous voices, indigenous history, indigenous names, we spent 200 years methodically erasing indigenous history. And we need to bring it back. We need to bring it back as part of reconciliation. We need to bring it back as part of our own learning. And it is so exciting. And absolutely, I want to join my mayor in thanking Christian Freeland um, for finally bringing us the money to revitalize this building, to make it again a key to, that we imagined so all those years ago that this building would be the key to our ravines. And now it will be. So we have so much to celebrate. And yes, we have a lot more to do. But we'll take every bit of progress we've got. And thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think maybe Jen doesn't need this, so uh, anyway, she's the giant here. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Sachs. Uh, and I always love the stories you tell about Evergreen's earlier days and the history. Thank you for your longtime friendship. Thank you for sitting in a cold building and dreaming of the future that we're trying to make come true. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And now, yes. And now I'd like to welcome Evergreen CEO, Jennifer Angel, to share a few words. I feel like a giant. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Susie uh, shared, I'm Jen Angel. I'm the new-ish CEO of Evergreen, and I am very grateful uh, for all of you making time in your busy schedules to join us this morning. Uh, I want to thank sincerely our Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, Mayor Chow, Councillor Sachs, uh, and our fearless leader, Helen Burston, uh, and many other board members in the room for, for joining us today. This is a vital project, as you have heard, and I want to voice my appreciation for the Government of Canada and Infrastructure Canada this program that has made it possible, or is it making it possible. Social infrastructure included, uh, included among it our shared public spaces has an outsized impact. It shapes how we live, how we move, who gets to participate. It's multi-solving. It can support our efforts to improve climate and repair the planet to support equity and engage diverse communities, and to support our health and well-being. It's critical to enable dense housing in our cities, which we desperately need, uh, and to build 
social connection and the, create the conditions for community to come together, as you heard so eloquently shared already by my colleagues. Yesterday, the Toronto Foundation released the Vital Signs Report, as others have referenced, uh, and uh, as that shows, such spaces have never mattered more. At their best, public spaces are green, they operate sustainably, at a high efficiency, and they're a regenerative climate asset. And they're inclusive, welcoming to everyone, meeting local needs, and reflective of the diverse communities who rely on them. Canada needs more green and inclusive community buildings and spaces. They make our cities and towns great places to live. And they create the conditions for everyone to thrive. I am really proud today to be able to share with you the beginnings of this revitalized space. The investment from Infrastructure Canada is going to make Building One here at the Brickworks into the Ravine Centre. <laughs> yeah. Toronto is fortunate to have the world's largest ravine system, uh, an extraordinary natural asset right alongside Canada's biggest city. I'm actually not from Toronto, and I was surprised to learn about the ravine system when I came here. Uh, but I was equally surprised to learn that a lot of Torontonians don't know or haven't had the chance to experience uh, the ravine sy uh, system. Included among those folks, many equity-deserving communities who exist along the trail. This project is the first step in a partnership together with the City of Toronto in advancing the Ravine strategy to ensure that this remarkable public uh, natural asset is available uh, to many more people in the city. The new space will act as a welcome centre for the ravines. It will introduce visitors to the 11,000 acres of ravine that scaffold the city. It will acquaint them with the many trails and active transportation routes and possibilities that connect neighbourhoods. It will help us all to better understand the flora and the fauna that call this urban wilderness home, from trilliums to white oaks to beavers and even coyotes. Again, alongside Canada's biggest city, this remarkable ecosystem exists. It will also showcase how the ravines are one of our greatest climate assets. When we have powerful storms, which unfortunately we've seen more and more of each year, the ravines channel water down to the lake. When we have heat waves, the ravines' trees and shrubs and waters help to keep our city cool. And they're essential to the city's biodiversity. Nearly 90% of Toronto's environmentally significant areas are in the ravines. So we're delighted and we take very seriously the responsibility of remaking this centre to be a showcase for resilient infrastructure. With the Government of Canada's investment, we're going to drastically reduce the impact of heating and cooling and lighting the centre, helping this 80-year-old building feel better than new. And there are many partners involved in this, as Susie uh, pointed out, and I do want to recognise Prime Consultant LGA DTAH, who are, I know are here in the audience and are helping us to steward uh, this very important property with care. The centre is going to have another vital role, which is perhaps the most important of all, and that is a dedicated space for Indigenous programming, including Indigenous interpretation uh, of this natural uh, place. Here at Evergreen, we're very lucky uh, to be uh, building wonderful partnerships with Indigenous serving organisations from across the city, Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre have been a partner with us for nearly two decades. And I also want to uh, extend my appreciation to Andrea, who is here in the audience today, and who has made the time. There she is. Hi, Andrea. Students from the Wandering Spirit School uh, visit the site for learning and celebration. Folks from the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto learn to plant and harvest and process medicines here. Others use this space and its lands and waters too. Our elder in residence, Catherine Tamara, was unable to join us today, unfortunately, but we also appreciate her guidance in this work. We're working together with Indigenous communities to redesign this centre to meet their needs for teaching and learning and artistic creation and cultural practice and ceremony. And in the coming months, 
will be delighted to welcome you here so they can share their programming plans for the building. Here at Evergreen, we're striving to create better public places for the health of people and the planet. And from coast to coast to coast, these places of community connection have never mattered more. We look forward to sharing this space and the greater Ravines ecosystem with each of you and to working together on many more projects here in Toronto and across the country so our cities are bursting with life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. And I uh, just want to echo Jen's words that we can't wait to welcome you back when the center is done. But please come back many, many, many times before then. Uh, now we are ready for our media Q&A. OK, final thoughts. I was taught this as a, a child that the human species was was placed here by our creator um, to be stewards over his creation. We were supposed to help protect it, help nourish it how we were we were supposed to ensure that other species could also grow and thrive along with us we were supposed to live in harmony with our other um, our other brother species on this planet we weren't supposed to just rape the land of natural resources and just mine things until um, hills disappeared until cut trees until all the entire forest, forest was gone so that we could build houses we weren't supposed to do things like that we were supposed to take what we needed and live in harmony with everyone or every other being on this planet and it doesn't seem like that's what we're actually doing anymore. That corporate greed have taken over. And we're tearing down more than we're building up. And we're finding limited resources because we're simply just overused. And overconsumed. And as leaders of the of the overconsumption and overuse living in North America means that we have to start learning the lessons of living in a more minimal and kinder way to our planet. It isn't just about polluting less. It is about making the human footprint smaller because it wasn't supposed to be big to begin with. Thank you for listening today. Please find that subscribe button wherever it may be and we will talk to you later. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.